I don't want people to know just the Sunday Jesus. If you want to tame your sinful desires in private, you have to know Jesus in private. Not the Sunday Jesus that's public, but the Jewish, ancient, crucified, resurrected, and victorious Jesus. Awesome, you guys ready to jump into a brand new series? I took my shoes off. Um, I don't know why, I just felt like, uh, huh? No, just leave them there. I'm gonna wear my Doc Martin socks. You guys are gonna have to navigate. Why did you tell us what kind of socks they are? Because they're so comfy. I feel like everyone should get one. Anyways, okay, I'm gonna preach in my socks today. I, don't, I feel like uh, there's a reason. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna pray. No, I'm not gonna pray yet. What am I gonna do, Jesus? Okay, so this series has really thrown me for a loop. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. God and Culture is our brand new series, and it has, I've been telling Pastor Esteban as I prepared for this message, this has really messed me up a little bit. Why? Why, Chadi? Well, because if I don't get this right, <laughs> this is going to be one of those where I stand in front of the Lord one day, and he's like, that one you did not get right. <laughs> um... The world, God, and culture are at odds, okay? They've been at odds since the beginning of time. Hashtag snake, hashtag Eve, hashtag vegan. And uh, they've been at odds with how to navigate our desires, um, at odds with how to navigate our speech and our words and how we fight for justice and how we see justice. Um, it's been at odds with um, how we see our purpose um, and how we see our calling. And so today I just want to pause um, today feels a little more sacred than normal. I don't know why. It shouldn't, but it does. And um, this is a series that is actually rooted in one of our five values. I don't know if you've been to our website lately or you know that what our five values are, but our very first value is we are uh, ambassadors of Christ. We have five values. If I had to give them to you in words, it's like clarity, connection, uh, community, uh, uh, Christ-centered. There's one more, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm the one that wrote them. You think I would know them. And um, clarity, community. Lord, there's another one. Lord's like, they don't need to hear it. Okay. Um, but the very first one is uh, uh, being an ambassador of Christ. And so this series is rooted in what it looks like to be an ambassador of Christ. So we're talking about God and culture. So as ambassadors of, ambassadors of Christ, I'm just going to say partners. That feels better. Um, we need to know how to navigate and tame our desires. We need to know how to tame our speech. We need to know how to uh, tame our truth, because everybody has one, and then um, our divine purpose. And so there is a story in the Bible um, where there's a burning bush, and um, Moses comes up to the burning bush, and, uh, and, and God gives him his name. He says, I, you know, I am the I am. And he has him take off his shoes um, because he's in front of him. And I don't know, man, I felt like I needed to take my shoes off today. I don't know if I'm going to do a Pentecostal run across the stage or maybe, maybe some Bethel dancing. I don't know. I don't know how I'm feeling yet. But I do know this. We as ambassadors of Christ are meant to be burning bushes. The type of bush that draws people in with God's presence and doesn't burn them. And so my hope is that it's a reminder to you as you're running around your house in socks that that's who you are and that's who you're meant to be. And so today we're talking about taming our desires. I'm going to give you practical wisdom how to guard yourself from all the things in your life that don't align to God's framework all the things in your life that don't speak to Jesus' truth, and all the things in your life that the Holy Spirit is not calling you towards, okay? So now I'm going to pray. Jesus, uh, oof, you got jokes. I really want to put my shoes back on. And, um, but yet, Father God, um, Lord, I know that just as equally as this message is uncomfortable, Lord God, you make things easy. So Lord, I just pray that this uh, revelation is your revelation and not mine. I pray, Father God, that... Um, 
every heart that these words fall upon, Lord God, that it would be like fertilizer to the seeds of their hearts, that they would bear good fruit, that it would bear God fruit. Lord, you are in this room. God, you are in this space. You have sat down at the table and said, I am here. And Lord, we just honor you and we love you. Lord, thank you, God, that it, the only audience that ever needs to be in the room is you. And so, Lord, as we talk about what it looks like to be a representative of you, God, you be glorified. You be honored. Guide us, Lord, today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Whether you have been saved for 20 minutes or 20 years, this, what I'm about to say, is true. Our sinful desires will always be something we have to tame privately, live out publicly, and surrender daily. I'm going to say it again. Whether you have been following Jesus 20 minutes, or whether you've been following Jesus 20 years, our sinful desires will always be something we have to tame privately, live out publicly, and surrender daily. Chadi, when you say sinful desires, what do you mean? Any action or desire or attitude that does not align to God's framework, Jesus' truth, or the Holy Spirit's guidance. I'm going to say it again because Pastor Esteban says I talk too fast. A sinful desire is any desire or action or attitude that does not align to God's framework, Jesus' truth, or the Holy Spirit's guidance. So I'm going to unpack this one at a time. So how do we tame our desires privately? First uh, John 2, 1 through 15. Uh, I'm going to jump into that. That's going to be my main text today. You are my little children. So I am writing these things to help you avoid sin. I mean, ain't that just great? Lord Jesus, give me a text. He said, boo, girl, go to 1 John. And I was like, oh my God, Jesus this is the best text. If, however, any believer does sin, we have a high-powered defense lawyer, Jesus, the anointed, the righteous, arguing on our behalf before the Father. Gosh, don't you just love the voice translation? It was through his sacrificial death that our sins were atoned, but he did not stop there. He died for the sins of of the whole world. God is so good. Three, we know we have joined him in an intimate relationship because we live out his commands. How do you know you're living out and taming your desires privately? It's because you actually live out his commands. If someone claims I'm in an intimate relationship with him, but this big talker doesn't live out God's commands, then this individual is a liar and a stranger to the truth. I didn't write that. Somebody in the Bible did. John did. Oh, it's John. He's petty. That makes sense. Okay. But if someone responds to and obeys his word, then God's love has truly taken root and filled him. This is how we know we are in an intimate relationship with him. Anyone who says, I live in intimacy with him should walk the path Jesus walked. As I wrote down the very first point, I thought, this feels like I'm kicking a dead horse at this point, Jesus. Um, and the first point is you need to know Jesus if you want to tame your stuff privately. Everyone here who drove here in a tropical storm already knows Jesus. And they're saying to themselves, ma'am, I feel like you could have gotten another point on this one. And I said that to the Lord. I said, Jesus, I feel like I've said this already. <laughs> and the Lord said, not a Sunday, Jesus. I don't want people to know just the Sunday Jesus. If you want to tame your sinful desires in private, you have to know Jesus in private. Not the Sunday Jesus that's public, but the Jewish, ancient, crucified, resurrected, and victorious Jesus. That's a lot. It's okay. I'm going to break it down. Sunday Jesus is fun. Sunday Jesus is loud and extroverted, and it makes you feel good. And sometimes, honestly, it doesn't lead to change. If it did, there'd be 850 people in these, in these seats. It's curated by his people. Sunday is curated by us who love Jesus. We're not perfect at all, but we're doing our best. But the private Jesus, the ancient crucified, resurrected, victorious Jesus that you talk to and you engage in private, he is not loud. He's actually really beautifully silent, and he calls us to solitude. He's fun, 
but not the way, he's fun like my awkward way of when, I, when people like show me something and I go, oh, that's fun. It's, not, it's like that kind of fun. It's going to make you a little convicted. It's going to be a little awkward, make you a little uncomfortable. That's how Kaylee knows I don't like her outfit. She'll walk in the house and she'll be like, hey, and I'll be like, oh, that's fun. And she's like, you got to stop saying that. And I'm like, no, but it's fun. And she's like, that's not what you say. That's not what, I see your eyes. It's not what's really coming out of your mouth. Um, her outfits are always great, but that's the only person I can use because she's my family that I can use <laughs> as an example. And Anyways, Jesus, when you spend time with Jesus alone, there's like a, a good, a good, a good hurt. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a good convicting. It's like, oh my bad, Jesus, I did not mean to do that. Like there's a lot of really internal things that happen when you get to know the private Jesus. And I started to think about like how much I love my husband. We've been married almost 21 years at this point. And um, when me and my husband got married, um, he, we had to write our own vows. It's great. And I wrote, I have, man, two pages. I love you. I vowed to do your laundry, I, um, which I did. And then I shrunk all his cashmere sweaters. I vowed to do your laundry. I vowed to cook you dinner occasionally. Um, I, I, I vowed to iron your clothes the way your mom did. I mean, it was, I had some fire vows. And then Esteban came up and he looked at me with his curly hair and his beautiful eyes. And he said, <sighs> He pretty much quoted the, the lyrics to Goo Goo Dolls' Iris. And I don't want the world to see that one. I don't know things that they don't understand. And everyone was like, he's a poet. <laughs> and I'm dancing and dancing it over, but I want you to know who I am. And everybody's just like, oh my God, did he write that? And then he switched to, I don't want to miss a thing from Aerosmith. He didn't write any vows. The man quoted Aerosmith lyrics to me on our wedding day in front of our entire church and family. Now, some of you might be saying, why did he do that? So that every Valentine's Day, he can put Ja Rule or J-Lo or whatever he wants to put on his Instagram, but he doesn't have to actually tell me anything. He has set himself up for a win. Now, I didn't know that on the day that I married my husband, that he was the funniest person in the world. Every day for 21 years, I have learned that my husband's funnier than me. Every day, he says something else that I steal. Every day, I learn something more about him that I love. All of a sudden, I realize the other day, he knows how to put the pillows on the bed. All this time, he was lying. He knows how to make the bed. And then the other day, he forgot that he wasn't supposed to do it correctly so that I'd stop making him do it. And then he did it perfectly. And I said, oh my God, I just learned something new. <laughs> Point about this, my husband knows how to make a bed. He knows how to put the pillows. Every day, I learn something new. Guys, if you pursue Jesus in private, guess what you're going to learn? New, amazing, incredible things of how awesome he is. And you can't replicate someone you don't know. You can't replicate God's love in culture if you don't know God in private. Culture wants you to live a Sunday faith. A Sunday faith isn't offensive. You know what a Sunday faith does? Go on Facebook and tell everybody about your religion. That's what that does. It doesn't really, like, love people well. It doesn't disrupt culture in the way that Jesus disrupted culture. Because I think Christians, and we'll get to this a little bit here in a minute, Christians are known to disrupt culture, but not in a good way. Is there a good way to disrupt culture? Yes. Disrupting culture isn't passive, okay? It's not like passive-aggressive fighting on the internet. It's loving God and loving others like Jesus. That verse that I read earlier, it literally says, I live in intimacy with him, so I walk out the path Jesus walked. Last time I preached, I talked about the narrow way, and it's narrow. And you have to walk it if you want to walk the ways of Jesus. If you want to tame your sinful desires in private, you have to know Jesus in private, and it's only a private faith, a private journey of scripture reading, presence, seeking, prayer, needing that enables us to tame those desires, those things that don't align to God, and that actually, what it does is it teaches us how to honor him. So recap. Whether you've been following Jesus 20 minutes or 20 years, your sinful desires will need to be tamed privately, lived out publicly, and surrendered daily. Okay, so how does one live out my desires, sinful desires, publicly? That feels like weird, right? Like, how do you do that? Like, what it, it, how do you live this out? Well, let's look at 1 John again. We'll jump into 7. Uh, my loved ones, in one sense, I'm not writing a new command for you. I'm only reminding you of the old command. It's a word you already know, a word that has existed from the beginning. However, in another sense, I'm writing a new command for you. The new command is the truth that he lived, and now you are living it too. 
because the darkness is fading and the true light is already shining among you. Anyone who says, I live in the light, but hates his brother or sister is living in the shadows. Anyone who loves his brother or sister lives in the light and will not trip because his conscience is clear. But anyone who hates his brother is in the darkness, stumbling around with no idea where he's going blinded by the darkness. If you want to tame your sinful desires in public, first you have to tame your desires in private by truly knowing who Jesus is, but also you need to know your role. Not only do you need to know Jesus, you need to know your role as an ambassador of Christ. Um, I looked back on our YouTube, and over the last two years, we've t- this is now the fifth time that we've referenced salt and light. Five, five, the number of grace. And I'm not even going to begin to try to preach a better message than what Pastor Estevan did with the lightsaber that one time. Do you guys remember that? That was incredible. And then Pastor Jen did an even more bonkers one in about, oh, that was nuts. And then Pastor Brian did one one time where he passed out salt to everybody. Do you guys remember that? It's, I, anyways, I made a highlighted YouTube uh, curated playlist of all the sermons that tell us who we are in Christ. You can go back and watch them this week. Um, and I just want to encourage you, I'm going to read it again, and then we're just going to talk about it. But at the end of the day, man, understanding who we are is so incredibly important. The enemy has been trying to attack our identity since the beginning. Since the very beginning. It's not like a new thing. He doesn't have like any new ca- tactics. The enemy can't create. He imitates, right? And he doesn't even do it in a good way. You are salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled a foot. You are the light of the world. Say light of the world. A town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. If you want to tame your sinful desires in public, you have to know who you are. You are salt and light. You are an ambassador to the king and his kingdom. And man, the culture wants to tell you you are other things. I googled it. What does culture say about Christians? It gave me a very intense list. God, Google, man. Google and Gemini. Okay, ready what Google and Gemini said you were? Here we go. Hypocrites, judgmental, intolerant, self-righteous, outdated, close-minded, fanatical. Honestly, we kind of are. Not us in the room. Everybody else. The Big C Church, it's true. We haven't done loving people well. We have forgotten that our role is not to be the religious elite but those that follow Jesus and are covered by his dust. You know, you know, God says, that's what culture says we are. God says that we are a chosen generation. It's in 1 Peter 2, 9. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that we can proclaim the praises of him who who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When me and my sister used to get into knockout dragouts when we were a kid, my mom would make us pray over each other stupidest thing in the world and then she would make us memorize verses this was the time that my sister threw the nintendo at me and um because she couldn't beat me up because she's little she was little and so she she would throw things we love her she's really still working on that here in her 40s anyways so just kidding she's great she's fantastic um but one time uh we were praying over each other and i don't know if you ever prayed over somebody you just want to punch in the face and she was just like lord bless her we're teenagers. I think I had like, I think I wore her shirt. I shouldn't. And so I was, I was wearing her shirt and she was praying over me. And then my mom's like, I want you to memorize this verse to remember who you are. I was like, why would you make us do that? And so her and I had to sit down with each other and teach each other this verse. And so every time I think who has called you out of his marvelous, called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, I just think of my sister looking at me. That's like, he's called you out of darkness. (laughs) Honestly, It makes me love this verse more because if we aren't saying that to the people that we're in strife with, if we're not really trying to love people that maybe don't look like us, think like us, then what are we even doing here? Just being flashlights amongst other flashlights. And God's called us to be poetry etched on lives. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the ESV, but the voice translation says we're poetry etched on lives. Man, God's poetry etched on lives. How beautiful is that? This means we are not forest fires of faith. This means we're lighthouses. 
and we're meant to shed the light of love on others, calling others from the darkness, calling others. You know, I did some research on lighthouses because I'm a little obsessed with them. Psalms 27 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, uh, chapters in the Bible. And lighthouses are usually put in places nobody wants to be. They're usually hanging off cliffs. They're not fun. You know what I mean? It's not like, hey, we're, we're going to put you in the middle of the ocean. May the Lord bless you. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not fun being a lighthouse because then you're there by yourself, just like light. You know what I mean? <laughs> I thought about this. I gave this a lot of thought, guys. I was like, this doesn't feel fun. And Jesus always has the same comeback. He's hilarious. He's like, you know, was it fun? The cross. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we're meant to be lighthouses, not forest fires. Forest fires that just consume things. Again, remember, we're that burning bush. We're meant to draw others in with love that embodies the scriptures like Jesus, not burn others with our religion and tradition. Culture has done a really bad job of telling us that we should sound like Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots. And Jesus is constantly, God is trying to remind us, guys, you're my ambassadors. Don't live the way culture is telling you. Live the way I'm asking you to because I gave my life for you. And I've given you the ways and the truth and the life to follow. And so whether you've been following Jesus 20 years, 20 minutes, them sinful desires have to be tamed privately. Chatty, why can't I do it publicly on Facebook? Well, that's weird. Start. Let's just start with that. Also, not everybody should know your business. Some things should be private. And the things that are usually sinful desires, that shouldn't be um, navigated in a public forum. You, the Holy Spirit needs to do a work on you. You need to have the right people around you. God's calling us to a place of maturity and discernment and discretion of knowing what to say and how to say it. Pastor Esteban's going to preach a message next week on what it looks like uh, to tame your tongue. Everyone needs to be in pocket for that. Because at the end of the day, like the tongue has the life and death. We're speaking life over things. And God wants to do something really beautiful in you. But you have to surrender your desires daily, which is the final thing. You need to know Jesus, you need to know your role, and you need to actually know what your desires are. Culture wants us to dull what is sinful. Like there's things actually going on in the world where we as followers of Jesus are like, that's not that bad. Is it bad? I don't think it's really bad. That's old school. But when you work out your faith privately and you walk out your faith publicly, the way Jesus did. You're able to identify your desires and then surrender to them wholly. Not wholly H-O-L-Y. Holy W-H-O-L-L-Y. All together. Let's go back to our main text. I'm writing to you, my children, because your sins have been forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, that our sins have been forgiven. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers and mothers, because you have known him as a creator and the one who started everything. I'm writing to you, young people, because he has given you the power to conquer the evil one. Come on. And I have written to you, my children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers and mothers, because you have known him as your creator. And I just want you to know, don't fall in love with this corrupt world or worship the things it offers. Those who, lo- those who love its corrupt ways don't have the father's love living in them. All the things, this is my favorite part, all the things that the world can offer you, the allure of pleasure, the passion to have things, and the pompous sense of superiority. There's another version of the Bible that says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They do not come from the Father. These are rotten fruits of the world. Yikes. This corrupt world is already wasting away as are its selfish desires. But the person doing God's will, that person will never cease to be. 1 John 2.16, I'm going to read it again in the ESV. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's of the world. In this series, God and Culture, we need to tame the things that culture tell us. Culture tells us it's okay. And you know what? A Sunday faith will tell you it's okay too. Because you only really talk to God on Sunday. Not you guys, everybody else. So let's talk about these desires of the flesh, these desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. The first thing is you need to identify them. I'm talking about like pull your phone out at some point today. Get a journal. Identify the things that don't align to God's framework. Identify the things in your life. Like if you want to be honest before God, you got to be honest with yourself. And be like, oh, that's a problem. Identify them. Admit them, admit them to a friend. 
Say, hey, this is, I'm really struggling with this. You can't tame your desire if you, don't actually tell, if you don't actually admit that it's a problem. Tell your pastor, tell or Pastor Esteban, tell a friend, get some accountability. <laughs> get some safeguards. My God, boundaries are not bad. Have you ever sat outside without a screened-in porch in Florida? Mm-hmm. Have you ever sat outside with a screened-in porch? No mosquitoes. No mosquitoes. And I believe that's what sinful desires are. Mosquitoes trying to suck your blood, right? For real. I feel like you'll never forget that. Anyways, whether you've been following Jesus for 20 minutes, whether you've been following Jesus for 20 years, he is calling us to a different type of relationship. He's calling us to a covenant relationship. It's a partnership. It's a partnership that allows us to know who we are as Christ's ambassadors. It's a partnership that looks like friendship and love and engaging him in ways that maybe other people don't engage him because we know who we are as sons and daughters of the living God. Amen? I'm going to end with this real quick. Pastor Esteban and I, when we got engaged to be married, um, Pastor Esteban and I had been talking for weeks about getting engaged. We're very young. We were early 2021. 20, um, he's so handsome. I was just like, can we just elope? Can we just get married? And he was like, no, I think we should wait. And I was like, okay, cool. And so on February 14th, 2003, he, he told me, go to work early and I'll pick you up around noon and then I'm going to have a really beautiful day planned. It's going to be amazing. I said, oh my God, it's happening. I told all my friends, it's happening, guys. We're going to get engaged today. And I got all dressed up. I went to work at like four in the morning, got off at noon. So cute. I was so dressed up. I was ready, full makeup, ready to go. I was skinny. I was killing it. And then he showed up in gym shorts, the raggediest pairs of shoes I've ever seen in my life, a t-shirt with holes in it, hadn't even brushed his hair. I think he had gone to the gym or something. And he's like, oh, you ready to go? And I was like, what's happening? Are you changing? And he was like, no, no, we're good. No, you're fine. I was like, I was like, I'm having a seizure. I think I'm having a stroke. Come get him, Jesus. And I was like, oh, no, maybe. I almost called myself by my government name. I was like, Sharice, don't get mad at him. Maybe he didn't have something nice to wear. That's okay. I spent my entire check and bought him an outfit. Honey, I bought you an outfit and I bought you a brand new pair of Nikes. Do you want to put them on? He was like, no. No, because we're going to do a lot of walking today. What? <laughs> we're going to go to St. Augustine, the worst place you can go if you're from Jacksonville, Florida, because it's where all the tourists are, and it's just walking. It's just walking in the hot. Like, you know this, Floridians. February is not cold. It's just as hot as everything else. Why would you walk me around so I'm mad? Now I'm mad. I just closed my computer. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm going back. I'm immediately mad again. I'm sorry. I love you. I already talked about how much I love you and you're handsome. And so I was like, this guy. Okay, so we get to St. Augustine. I don't even have the shoes for this. Yo, he has paraded me. We went to the fort the fort in St. Augustine. And I'm like, I'm like, we passed this really beautiful art gallery with like, um, with like this, I mean, it's gorgeous. Every plant you can, it was like stunning, romantic. Yes, chef's kiss, amazing. And I'm like, he's like, you want to go see the art? And I'm like, oh my God, redemption, is it happening? And so we walk in, we walk in, and he's just like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, so I'm like, oh, more walking. So now I'm sweating, and now I'm like, my makeup is coming off. It's now like two, three, or four o'clock. And I'm like, honey, I'm, babe, I'm, I'm starting to get a little hungry. Did you make, you remember you said you were going to make um, reservations? He goes, ah. I forgot. But there's a Hungry Howie's Buffet. We can hit that. I was like, he's lost his mind. And I can't break up with him right now because he's my ride back to Jacksonville. That's a 45-minute trek. <laughs> I got, <laughs> I, what are we going to do? That's not before Uber. I didn't have a cell phone. This is 2004, family. I had a Nokia with 13 minutes left, and I only can make calls at 9 p.m. If you haven't lived until you can only make calls at 9 p.m., I had 13 minutes, and that was for emergencies only. So I had to not break up with him. I was like, okay, well, we'll go to Hungry Howie's. Worst experience of my life. Hungry Howie's Buffet, fam. Hungry Howie's Buffet. So now I'm mad. Now I'm like, now I'm fuming. Now I'm like sweating. I just want to break up with him. Get me back to Jacksonville. I can't even believe you didn't even put the clothes on that I had spent my whole check on. It wasn't even that much. I just only made like $5 an hour at that time. It was ugly. And so he's like, you know what? You look like you need some dessert. I was like, oh my God, he's going to take me somewhere nice. Dunkin' Donuts on the way home. 
So I call my, my friend um, in the Dunkin' Donuts because he went to the bathroom. And I said, I'm breaking up with him. I'm breaking up with him. Oh my God, this dude is so stupid. Like, I thought he loved me. We've been having talks. He, this is the worst Valentine. This is the most, like, unromantic. This dude is, I don't know what happened. It's like, I don't even know this man because he's like the most romantic person in the world. I don't even know him. I want to hold his hand. I, wanna, I can't even make eye contact with him brown eyes right now because he's going to get an open palm slap like I was so mad I was so mad and so he comes over and I'm like okay girl love you hang up and I'm just like mm. and so um we get in the car and he's like we should go see a movie and I was like that feels right let's go see daredevil yes that feels right let's let's go see I just get me out of here get me into some air conditioning and um so then he's like actually you know what before let's, let's go to the beach let's do some still more walking Let's go to the beach. I feel like the beach is the right place for us. <sighs> I know y'all only know me at 43, but at 22, 21, I still hated the beach, okay? <laughs> okay. Because in Jacksonville, the beaches, the water is, um, is like navy blue, and it's full of, like, alligators and sharks, okay? We don't get in the water in North Florida. It's disgusting. And so he was like, let's go to the beach at night. I've seen Jaws. We're not going to the beach at night. What are we doing? Are we doing a walkabout? We're going to walk on the beach? I'm literally holding his hand going, how do I break up with him? How do I break up with him? The moon is shining like this light in my face. It's beautiful. And he goes, oh, look. There's a light, there's like one of those like little chairs where the lifeguards sit. Let's go sit there. Okay. So we climb up in my shoes that I shouldn't, that are ruined at this point. Ruined at this point. And so we climb up to this little thing and he pulls out a Palm Pilot. Now for you kids that don't know what a Palm Pilot is, it's before the smartphone. And it's like all where all the smart things were. Okay, so it's like you could play Tetris and write notes, and he pulls out this little Palm Pilot, and he has a pen. He's like, I wrote you a poem. Okay. I don't know if you met my husband. He's not real big on poetry. He's the same guy that, that said, I don't want to miss a thing on our wedding vows. And so I was like, he's, he's, he's messing with me. There's something. I, I, I don't want to be with him anymore. Like, I'm literally, this is it. We're breaking up after the poem. And he's like, He's just, all I hear is wah, 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 By the way, if you're not doing anything for the rest of your life, will you marry me? What? What? And he's looking at me and he's like, if you're not doing anything for the rest of your life, will you marry me? Apparently he had read like a whole poem and I did. <laughs> I was so mad that the experience was not great. And I said, well, where's the ring? And he was like, oh. Well, you haven't even answered. So I, I said a word that wasn't Christ-like, or I did not identify as a master of Christ. And, and then he pulled it out, and I just took it from him. And then I p grabbed his Palm Pilot, and I put it over it so I could see how big it was. <laughs> I was, I, honestly, I can't believe this man's been married to me for 21 years. He's a, he is, he is, take care of him. Everybody, at all costs, he's the greatest. And then he kind of took the ring back. <laughs> and he was like, is there, are you going to answer? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll marry you. And then I was just like, like, for like three minutes. And um, I love that story. It's my favorite thing because at the end of the day, my husband had to drag me and walk me through this situation so that I wouldn't realize he was about to ask me to marry him. He had actually, my husband who always smells like a million bucks and looks amazing and is always ironed, dumbed down the entire day to make it horrible, to teach me something that I didn't realize I needed to be taught. I really, really wanted the experience of the engagement. I didn't realize the importance of the covenant relationship we were about to walk in, so much so that we bro broke up three weeks later. <laughs> it's my fault. It's always my fault, guys. If it has to do with us, it's me. And we broke up three weeks later. <sighs> it's a different story for a different day. We got back together. We're married. I don't want to miss a thing. It's not the point. <laughs> I have found that many times we as Christians really care about the experience. Is the worship good? Do I feel good? Did I dress appropriately? Does everything look good and clean and smell nice? Because if, if it doesn't, Jesus, I don't really want to go help that person. I don't really want to go to that place. I don't want to really drive there. I don't want to go there because people are going to say hi to me for three minutes. There's a lot of things. 
And God's calling us to a partnership. See, Esteban understood that the only thing that really mattered at the end of the day was that it was going to be me and him in our tiny 500-square-foot apartment with a car that leaked antifreeze and weird neighbors that were doing things that they eventually got arrested for. He knew that at the end of the day, we just needed Jesus and each other. And so I'm here to remind you today that you just need Jesus and each other. That, it, that if God's calling us to be ambassadors of Christ that really don't care about the things that culture says we should care about. This is not a consumer church. We're building, um, you know, we say a lot, uh, we're building a community. We're not building a crowd. But I would venture to say in this new season, we're not building just a community. We're building the kingdom. And that's who we are as hope. And we're not worried about the things others might be worried about. We just really care about the partnership. We really care about the covenant. And so in response, we know Jesus. We know our role. We know what our sinful desires are. And as a response, we surrender them. Amen? So I guess I just have two questions, and then I'm going to let Kaylee um, come up. But what do you need to tame privately? Don't tell me. Tell Jesus. Unless you really need help, then come tell me. What do you need to tame privately? What do you need to change in your life to live out your faith and tame desires publicly? Have you identified what those things are? Because that's my hope. Kaylee, I'm going to have you pray over them if you can. But that's my hope for you today. That you will... Um, yeah that you'll understand who you are in Christ because this culture wants to tell us so many things that are anti-God. But if we know who our God is, then those things won't matter. Amen? Amen. I think just right where you're at, whether that's at home online or here in this room, I would just like us all to bow our heads, close our eyes, and just take a couple of breaths. and really think about those questions that Pastor Chadi asked you. What are your desires? Do they align with what God is saying? What he has written in his word? When you look in the mirror, who do you look like? Jesus or the crowd? Just right where you're at. If you're seeing the crowd, which I'll be the first to raise my hand, there are a lot of areas in my life where I look like the crowd. And that might have even been this morning on my way here in the rain, thinking about how I didn't want to mess up my hair. And I have to repent for that because in that moment I wasn't thinking of the one that could be in this room today. I was thinking of myself and my hair. And so I repent. Father, forgive me for looking more like the world than like your son. And so right where you're at, just privately, let God speak to you. Let Jesus speak to you in this moment. Maybe while you're sitting there, you're realizing that you may need to get to know Jesus a little better. You actually need to engage in a relationship with him. Whether that be for the first time or kind of reestablish your relationship with him, your priorities get them kind of back on track. It's just like the car. Sometimes it needs to go in for an alignment. Sometimes we start swaying a little bit to the left or to the right. We need to get back in, on track. So again, privately, only you know 
where you're at with Jesus. And I'm going to say a prayer out loud and just know it's over everyone here. But let's get back in line with Jesus. Get back with a king into the kingdom mindset rather than a worldly mindset. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your son and his sacrifice. And there might be some here today that want to make that first step and accept Jesus in their heart. God, you know who the, those people are. And we say thank you for the opportunity to accept Jesus as our savior. God, everyone here, just put Jesus back at top priority over our lives. Allow us to get to know him privately. Put a stirring in our hearts, a desire to pursue Jesus rather than the world. Make it evident to us where we need to die to our sinful desires, die to ourselves and pick up our cross, God so that we can live this out publicly, so people will be drawn to us, not because we're cool and we're trendy, but because there's something different about us. We have joy when others have dread. We feel peace when the world around us is stressed. We're a burning bush, but it's not destroying anything. We thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. And everyone said, amen.